from inside our two-bedroom apartment in downtown Baltimore. It is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen here with you as always. Brendan with a last-minute shirt change. Yeah. Looks good. I was concerned. The last shirt that I had on looked slightly like a flannel, and I didn't want to come across as anything less than professional. Because if there's one thing that I've said about our podcast is that we are the epitome of professionalism. Here. I thought you were going to say, if there's one thing that I've said about Lumberjacks, it's that they are unprofessional. So, uh, I would never say that about Lumberjacks. <laughs> yeah. I think they do a great job. They, they do, <laughs> except deforestation is a problem, Brendan. This is true. Um, all right. We got a lot to talk about here on the... Uh, I, I've gone with the sweater, by the way, for those who are watching on yes. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I've gone with the green sweater, as tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day. Correct. I think so. I think I've so lost too. track of all time. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday was the Ides of March. All days are the same. Yeah, today's just kind of the day in between. Just be careful on St. Patrick's Day. Um, my girlfriend and I saw somebody uh, out enjoying the festivities for St. Patrick's Day in uh, Baltimore get on a one of those scooters that you see around the city yeah. and immediately crash it into a parked car within well, thank goodness within it was thirty parked. seconds of them unlocking the scooter. Yeah. So, yeah, thank goodness it was parked yeah. because uh, they were probably not uh, safe to drive. And then we made sure that they walked to their distance. Right. Now, is there a different level of required sobriety for driving a car versus driving a scooter? I thought you were going to say for St. Patrick's Day and uh, not St. No, Patrick's Day. No, I'm Day. saying I, I, for driving a car versus driving a scooter. I don't think there is because you can get pulled over for speeding on a bike. Do you know that? No. Yeah. If you're, if you're going past the speed limit, but you're on a bike, you can still get pulled over. Like a pedal bike, not like a motorcycle yeah, bike. Yeah, like bike. a pedal bike. Yeah. So I would think that the same rules apply here. Huh. So just be careful out there. On That's your, all I'm saying. On your little lime scooters. Yeah, and we have March Madness. We this do. Week, which is Whole bunch hugely happening exciting. This uh, and we have Michael Franco. That we do. That, I think, overrides the Orioles stealing headlines from March Madness. Yeah. From Selection Sunday. Right. By... Uh, coming close to an agreement right now with free agent third baseman Mike Alfranco. We're going to talk about that on the podcast. We're also going to have the all mascot draft, Brendan. We teased it last week. Much anticipated. We did no research last week. None whatsoever. Uh, we have done the research, however, this week. At least some of it. At least some of it. Uh, I tweeted out, I haven't even checked the poll. I should probably check the poll. I tweeted out how high should the Oriole bird go in this draft. Yeah. And uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to base... Where well, I pick be, the Oriole bird. That will be big for you because you, Paul Mancano, have the first overall pick. I do. But I think we know who that we, we've said who the first overall pick is going to be on the on previous yes. podcasts. It is. We, we kind of know. Yeah. It's kind of a given. Uh, picks one through three is what a lot of people think. Wow. So maybe use Ooh. that to inform where you think the uh, the Oriole bird should get drafted, Brendan. Wow. You do have picks two and three. That I do. It is, is going to be a five-round draft, so 10, 10 mascots total taken off the board. Something to think about. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to conduct the all-mascot uh, all draft, but first, Brendan, got to start with Mike Alfranco. Have to. We started, uh, or we ended last week's podcast, rather, by talking about Mike Alfranco and what he could mean for this Orioles team because there were rumors swirling that they were interested. However... There were other teams that are in a more competitive cycle that were also rumored to be interested. The New York Mets were one of them. Uh, and we thought that there was a chance that a more competitive team might snap him up, considering Franco is probably the best, at least position player, maybe best free agent left on the market right now. I mean, I can't think of anybody else who's just sitting out there waiting to be taken with opening day less than three weeks away. Right. I, I would agree with you. However, I think... The same argument can be made for Michael Franco coming to the Orioles as the argument was made for Freddie Galvis coming to the Orioles. And what he was saying in his first press conference was that the Orioles gave him a chance to start. And I don't think if Michael Franco goes to a team like the Mets that he is their starting third baseman. It's not like Michael Franco is some really old veteran. He's on the better side of 30. Mm -hmm. And he is still trying to prove that he can be a consistent third baseman at the major league level. And with the Orioles, you have a chance to play most days. And you have a chance to show that you can continue to be a good third baseman. So it's the same thing with Freddie Galvis. If a team gives you an opportunity to play, 
you take that opportunity where you can play more days than if a contender says, hey, want to play every few days. And like we said on last week's podcast, if you play well enough in the first half of the season with a non-contender like the Orioles, maybe you get flipped to right. a contender and you end up spending August and September and maybe make an October run with a team that is uh, pushing for a World Series title. Uh, and, and probably on that team, he would probably be a bench bat, maybe a fill-in third baseman, but on this current Orioles team, he very much slides into your starting third baseman spot. He definitely would take that spot from Rio Ruiz. Now, also at the time of recording of this podcast, this may change by the time you listen to it, but this deal has not yet been finalized. It has been several days now. We have heard it is going to get finalized, so I'm assuming it's going to happen in the next few hours at some point, but here we are and. They, the Orioles are the overwhelming favorite to get this deal done. John Heyman of MLB Network also reporting that it will be an MLB deal, not a minor league deal, which um, we were discussing last week on the pod that it would be in between. We think he's a player that's right in between a major league and a minor league deal at this point in his career. A major league deal certainly does not look good for Rio Ruiz. Because a major league deal tells me that Michael Franco is absolutely coming in here to be your starting third baseman. Right. And it's interesting because I think there are a lot of fans who aren't really sure if Michael Franco is that big of an upgrade over Rio Ruiz. We talked about it on the podcast last week. We both decided that, yes, he is most definitely an upgrade and he is most definitely worth signing to start at third base over Rio Ruiz. He is probably a bit of a downgrade defensively, but like you were, we were saying last week, Paul, the defense has gotten better over the last few years, and he is so much better offensively that it, I think the upgrade is definitely worth it, even if it bumps Rio Ruiz possibly down to the AAA level or just off the team. Yeah, and the tradeability, I think, factors into this as well, and I think, in theory, Michael Franco has more tradeability at this point than Rio Ruiz. I don't know how highly Rio Ruiz is viewed around the league. Let's overview Rio Ruiz's time with the organization in case this is the end of Rio Ruiz's time here. He played 181 games over the past two seasons. He was one of Mike Elias's first additions to the roster when he took over as GM back in November of 2018. Less than a month into the job, he took Rio Ruiz and, and picked him up off waivers. He had a history with Rio Ruiz going back to the Houston Astros. He had 21 homers over the course of his, his Orioles career. Looked like he was starting to take a step up last year. At the beginning of the 2020 season, he had a good first month. Was crushing the ball, was drawing a lot of walks, and then it kind of fell apart, and he kind of felt like he regressed back to what we saw for most of the 2019 season from Rio Ruiz. The consistency just isn't there offensively. Defensively, he is a pretty solid third baseman. He's not great. He's probably a little bit above average defensively. And if Rio Ruiz hit like he hits for a week or two out of the season where he is just smashing the ball and he's hitting home runs, then Rio Ruiz you could potentially see as maybe not your long-term answer at third base, but at least a fixture there for a little while. Yeah. But the problem is that he is so inconsistent that it's hard to trust him at an everyday level at third base. It's kind of similar to Renato Nunez. Yeah. Where he, at some points, would be a fantastic DH. You needed him in the lineup. And sometimes he just couldn't make contact. And yeah. Ruiz has that same similar type of inconsistency where as the Orioles progress through this rebuild, he has, given, has, has been given a chance to be that diamond in the rough, to be an Anthony Santander where it's a low risk, very high reward signing, but he just hasn't shown that so far. And after a few years, that clock is winding down. You don't get an unlimited amount of opportunities to show that you can be that guy if you haven't been showing it yet. And for 2019 and 2020, there was no prospect that was waiting right in the wings ready to take over the third base job. So Rio Ruiz had a hold on that for a couple seasons. But now as we enter the 2021 season, Ryland Bannon appears to be pretty close to the big leagues. He probably, my guess is, starts the season at AAA Norfolk or at the alternate site, I suppose, for the first month of the season once that they wait for the season to get started in minor league baseball. But he is probably going to make his debut in 2021. He's looked pretty good, I would say, at, in spring training down in Sarasota. So the clock was kind of ticking on Rio Ruiz to begin the 2021 season, even without this signing. Yes. I think Ryland Bannon 
especially with his versatility, he probably makes a better case to be on this roster at this point than Rio Ruiz does. Yeah. Because Ruiz, if he's ready. If, if, he's ready. if he's ready. Right. Because Rio Ruiz can pretty much only play third. Maybe you could shift him over to first, but that's not really a position that the Orioles need depth at. They have yeah. plenty of guys that can play first between Mancini and Ryan Mountcastle and, heck, now Michael Franco. So that's not really a position that you need depth at. Ryland right. Bannon, on the other hand, you can put him at third, and you can probably put him at second base as well. So if Bannon is ready for the major league level offensively, I think defensively he gives you more versatility and thus more value for Brandon Hyde. Yeah, and some people are commenting that Ruiz was a horrible signing. He was claimed off waivers, so let's not, Rio Ruiz. Let's not act like he was a big signing in, in free agency right. and he was the the prized guy to bring in you get anything from Rio Ruiz and that's a win yeah well I want to say real quickly also when you look at the signings of the Orioles of the past couple of years the the quality of signings has actually gone up slightly I know that's really not saying much it, it's not like they were players for George Springer this offseason or or Trevor Bauer like they were going to sign somebody to a major deal however the first offseason that Michael Elias took the job, and granted, he took the job in November, so it was already, you know, almost a month into that free agency, so he kind of was behind the eight ball there. He only made one major league signing in that offseason, in the 2018-19 offseason, and that was Nate Carnes, who was barely on the team, was on the team for about a month, and that was about it. The 2019-2020 offseason, slight step up. Cole Stewart was a major league deal. And then Jose Iglesias was a one plus one, a one year made uh, deal with a one year team option on the end of that, that the Orioles ended up picking. This offseason so far, again, not high priced free agents, but two major league free agents in the left side of your infield in Freddie Galvis and Michael Franco, both of whom have played together, by the way, when they were with the Philadelphia Phillies. They overlapped for four seasons there. So that'll be a kind of a fun storyline once this deal gets finalized. Uh, but I think, essentially, Michael Elias is spending just a little bit more here in this offseason and a little bit more than he did last year and the year before. And I think the reason for that could be that he's kind of more okay with handing out these major league deals if he, is com if he believes, is confident that he can flip at least one of these guys. Yes. Either at the deadline or earlier on, in their, in their Orioles tenure. Well, and that raises an interesting point too there, Paul. I'll ask you this question. Yeah. The Orioles infield is drastically different than it was last year. Hugely. You hugely. have a new third baseman shortstop and second baseman, and heck, you might have a new first baseman as well if Trey Mancini is your regular there. Yeah. So who are you taking? Are you taking the 2020 Orioles infield or the 2021 Orioles infield that now features Michael Franco, Freddie yeah. Galvis, and Yolmer Sanchez? Well, it's it's... Tough to say. So last year's, of course, you just mentioned this year's uh, infield, what it's going to look like. Last year's was Hanser Alberto at second, Jose Iglesias at short, and Rio Ruiz at third. And, and for now, we're just assuming that this deal is going to get done. And, and we'll, we'll talk about his future with the organization, but yeah, he's obviously, if this deal gets done, he's not going to be your starting third baseman. That is a vastly different infield. And you mentioned Trey Mancini at first. Right. So, like, he was already in the organization, obviously, but missed last year. That means literally all four infield literally positions. Literally the entire infield. This feels like a year ago that you had Alberto and Iglesias and Ruiz in third. Yeah. It feels like a year ago. Um, I think that there are positives and negatives along the line. And it's also tough to say because we haven't seen these guys play for the Orioles yet. We haven't right. seen any of these three guys, Yolmer Sanchez, Freddie Galvis, or Michael Franco, in an Orioles uniform, except for a few spring training games from Sanchez and Galvis. So it's tough to predict what you're going to get from these guys. Going in, on a case-by-case -case basis, let's start at second base with Hans Alberto, Yolmer Sanchez. I think that's probably a, an even exchange offensively and a positive exchange defensively. Yes, I think I would agree. Sanchez is, Sanchez is a step up defensively, and I think Alberto and Sanchez are right around the same mark offensively. Yeah, I think offensively they do a lot of similar things. Like They're not going to hit home runs. They probably aren't going to get too many extra base hits, and if they do, they're going to be doubles, and maybe sometimes they'll leg out triples. But 
Yomer Sanchez, you're hoping, is maybe going to hit around 280. Yeah. If he has a good season offensively, I know Hans Herr Alberto that's will a, maybe That's a little hit, on the high end. I don't yeah, know. A little on the high end. So maybe Hans Herr Alberto hits for a slightly better average, but Yomer Sanchez gives you gold glove defense at second base. Yeah. So personally, you know me, I'm a sucker for defense. I would probably say that Yomer Sanchez is either as good as Hans Herr Alberto, if not a slight upgrade. Yeah. And Hans Alberto, of course, signed a minor league deal with the Kansas City Royals. So, again, uh, Mike Elias, you know, kind of read the market correctly in terms of they tried to trade him. Didn't look like there was a whole lot out there. He ended up having to to sign a minor league deal. So, we'll see if he ends up sticking with that Royals team or if he ends up back in the free agent market. Shortstop, you're going from Jose Iglesias to Freddie Galvis. Two glove first shortstops. Right around the same age. I think two of these two guys are very similar players. Mm -hmm. I think the change here is negligible. I think it's both offensively and defensively, I think that they are pretty much the same player. I mean, there's there's not a huge difference here other than the fact that Iglesias is a year older. I think that these two guys are roughly the same quality of player. Yeah, and it's tough to evaluate a little bit too because Jose Iglesias lit the world on fire offensively somehow last year for the Orioles. So you can't really base how you're valuing Jose Iglesias on how he performed with the Orioles, Yeah, if that makes sense. like You can't look at Jose Iglesias and say that he's going to have a ridiculous OPS and a ridiculous batting average. He's having a ridiculous spring training. He is having a very good spring training, but I think it would be slightly unfair to look at Jose Iglesias and say that he is way better than Freddie Galvis while just evaluating how Iglesias was in an Orioles uniform. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe you get a little bit more consistency from Freddie Galvis in terms of games played. Right. He, Iglesias played a lot of games at DH. Yeah, he, too. he only played, what, 37, 38 games total this last yeah. pe- season as he was dealing with a hamstring strain. Not many of them at shortstop. That For, forced Pat Vileka and Ramon Urias over there a lot. Yeah, Freddie Galvis has played all 162 a few times in his career. Yeah. So maybe, and you can never predict health with a player, but maybe you're getting a healthier player who's going to be more often in your lineup, and at short. Right. All right, at third base, going from Rio Ruiz to Mike Alfranco, I think that we have agreed on this podcast that is a step up offensively, a slight step back defensively, but overall, the whole player package, Mike Alfranco is a better player than Rio Ruiz. Yes, I think of any of the infield positions, this is the one that we can look at and say pretty definitively that the version of 2021 at third base that you were getting is better than the version of third base that you had in 2020. Right. I think out of any of the positions, this one has the clearest cut upgrade. And now we have some breaking news to discuss, which is the news that we said maybe by the time you're listening to this, it will have been finalized. It has reportedly been finalized. Jeff Passan of ESPN reporting that the deal is done. The physical has been passed and Rockabaco, of course, confirming it for MassInSports.com. Michael Franco is a Baltimore Oriole. So now that it has been confirmed, Brendan, yep. we can move on to the topic of Rio Ruiz and what happens to Rio Ruiz uh, now that Michael Franco has apparently supplanted him in the Orioles' roster and in their Uh, opening day depth chart. Right, and we talked about it before, and if it wasn't clear by the signing of Michael Franco, he is not coming in, at least we presume, maybe we could be wrong, we often are, he is coming in to be the starting third baseman. He is not coming in to be the backup to Rio Ruiz, and Rio Ruiz probably does not offer you a ton of versatility, because like we were talking about before, Rio Ruiz, you can probably realistically put in three places in the lineup, at third base, at first base, and at DH. With Michael Franco on the roster, he is no longer the best third baseman on the roster. There is plenty of depth at the first base position between Trey Mancini, Ryan Mountcastle, and of course now Michael Franco, who can also shift over to first. And you probably wouldn't put him at DH either, because I think there are better options that you could potentially put at DH, whether it's Trey Mancini, Ryan Mountcastle, DJ Stewart, one of the outfielders that you're just hoping to get in the lineup. I don't think Rio Ruiz cracks your top options for any of those spots that he could potentially work into the lineup. So the question then becomes, does he even make the team? Right, yeah. I mean, uh, a few days ago, 
interestingly enough, Brandon Hyde was asked what he looks for from a utility player because you have a 26-man roster. You could go with 14 pitchers, which we've talked about on this podcast. It seems like a ridiculously high number, but considering the fact that you have a strange season in which pitchers did not pitch an entire year, you want to work some guys back, ramp them back up to um, a normal workload for a regular season, maybe you want a little bit of extra depth. Uh, either in the starting rotation or in the bullpen, just to make sure that guys don't get overworked too early in the season. So that means you have very few spots in your roster where you can just carry guys and hang on to them, which makes life difficult for like a Rule 5 pick, but it also makes life difficult for guys that are not true utility players. So Hyde was asked, what do you look for in in a true utility player? Does he have to be able to play shortstop? And Brandon Hyde was honest and said, Ideally, yes. Ideally, he does play shortstop. Rio Ruiz does not fit that spot. Ramon Urias, Pat Vileka, both of those guys can play shortstop. Right. Rio Ruiz cannot. And the fact that he, uh, uh, you know, is not versatile in that aspect makes it difficult for him to stick on this roster. Right. And Brandon Hyde talked about it, and let's hear what he has to say about it. Yeah. Well, you definitely would like them to play shortstop. So for me, a true utility player is then able, able to play short, able to spell your shortstop, able to spell your second baseman, third baseman, possibly a corner outfield in, if need be. The more guys you have like that, the better. And today's day with uh, you know, the grind of a six-month season and the ability to have to give, you know, try to give guys days off, uh, you know, you'd like to have as many guys that you can that can play multiple spots. And uh, so shortstop is, is if you, you definitely need a backup shortstop and if it's your true utility guy, that's a, that's a bonus. And Paul, obviously if you are a utility guy, the ability to play shortstop helps you a lot, but I'll ask you a question. Yeah. We know that Chris Davis is dealing with an injury. He might not start the year with the team who will probably be on the injured list. Once he comes back at some point, I don't know if Rio Ruiz really has a role, but Paul, do you think that Rio Ruiz? My name's Paul, not not but Paul. But Paul, yes. uh, Could you potentially see Rio Ruiz sticking on the roster at least initially as a combination backup first baseman while Chris Davis is still out, or backup third baseman to Michael Franco? I don't know if he has enough value as solely a backup third baseman, but at least for the time being, while you don't have Chris Davis to be a backup first baseman, could Rio Ruiz find a spot there? You're also going to be without Hunter Harvey, most likely, I think, to start the season because he's dealing with an oblique injury. You mentioned the the back injury that Chris Davis has. To me, I think it's just more likely that you, if they were considering going with 14 pitchers before these injuries and before the Franco signing, I think especially they are more likely to go with 14 pitchers. Really? I just think Hunter Harvey, you want to replace with a pitcher, I think, just to make that an even swap right? in terms of his spot on the roster. But for Chris Davis going out, I just don't see a a natural replacement. And, I mean, Rio Ruiz can play first. Michael Franco can play first. But you already have Mal Castle and Mancini on the roster. Those guys can play first. Valeka can play first. I just don't think you need to... I, I, I don't see the benefit in carrying Rio Ruiz because what what's the long-term goal there? That he hits well enough in a backup role that you eventually... like there there Unless an injury occurs, a spot is never going to open up for him. And uh, really, unless the injury occurs at third base. Because if an injury occurs at first base, you have other guys in the organization that can fill that spot. So the only way that he makes sense is if you have an injury to Mike Alfranco. Right. And heck, I mean, even if there's an injury at some point, I think if there's an injury at third or first, depending on how late it is in the season, you could realistically look at that and say, maybe you'd rather call up Tyler Nevin or Ryan yeah, Bannon. Exactly. Or yeah, or just move Mount Castle to first, right. call up Ryan McKenna or use Neil Diaz and stick them in the outfield. So there, I, there just does not seem to be, in a similar way to the way that we talked about Renato Nunez during yes. the offseason, where we thought that he was a good enough player in theory to make the team, but we could not find a suitable spot for him. Right. I see a very similar scenario here with Rio Ruiz, and honestly, he's not 
quite the offensive player that Renato Nunez is. He has not done quite enough to deserve a spot uh, in this on this team. That being said, if they can still, I, I believe he's out of options, they can designate him for assignment which means that he will be exposed to waivers. If he goes unclaimed, he could accept his assignment and stay within the organization and go down to the AAA level or the alternate site. That might be the best course of action for him because I don't know if he gets a better opportunity with another team. But I think long-term, even if he does that, his days are somewhat numbered in the Orioles organization because even if he does that, he's down at the alternate site, AAA Norfolk to start the year, you're probably going to, uh, unless an injury occurs again, you're going to call up Ryland Bannon at some point during the season. You're going to have internal candidates that you'd like to see over Rio Ruiz. And he's also not helped by the fact that there are some fringe roster guys that are playing really well in spring training so far. I mean, you look at position players, Jemai Jones and Ramon Urias are both battling for a roster spot. They have both looked really good. I think there's a pretty good chance Jemai Jones still starts at AAA. But Ramon Urias, I mean, he's fighting for a roster spot, and he's much more versatile and can play shortstop. So I think Ramon Urias would probably have a leg up on Rio Ruiz. And then in with players in general, I mean, look at Bruce Zimmerman. We didn't really talk about Bruce Zimmerman all that much in terms of a candidate who might crack the starting rotation or crack the Orioles' bullpen. He is pitching like he really deserves to be on this yes, team. He is. And I think if you are saying, okay, do we give a roster spot to back up third baseman Rio Ruiz or Bruce Zimmerman, who has gone nine innings, no earned runs, and 10 strikeouts? Yeah, one you, hit. You've got to go Bruce Zimmerman, yeah, right? Br- Bruce Zimmerman is, is one of the better storylines of spring so far. Yes. A guy who, you know, local kid, of course, got to mention it, uh, came over, if you remember, in, in one of the Dan Duquette trades <laughs> years ago. Yeah. I believe it was the Kevin Gosman deal when they sent him to the Braves. Uh is a little bit older for a prospect. I think he's going to turn 27 at, po- at some point during this season. Uh, a lefty and a guy that kind of has been overlooked when you talk about the guys who are ready to take the next step up in the organization. We always we always mention Zach Lowther or Alexander Wells or Michael Bauman or even Kevin Smith before we get to Bruce Zimmerman because he has he's not a top 30 prospect. A lot of people don't view him as a guy with the same high ceiling as some of those previously mentioned prospects. But he has been lights out this spring. Yes. There, it, it appears that, you know, there is still more. There, His ceiling may be higher than we expected. And I know it's spring training and we like to overreact to spring training. But he has absolutely, I think, pitched his way at least close to the fringes of the May opening day roster. I'm not going to give it to him yet. But I think if he continues to pitch like this over the next two weeks... It's hard to keep them off. Yeah, and that's the fun thing about this Orioles spring training, and the Orioles specifically, because you are still in that rebuild mode. You are still looking for guys that might be diamonds in the rough, and if you show that potential in spring training leading up to a season, you can realistically get a spot. Yeah, You know, you're not playing for a contender at this point. You aren't a starting pitcher in in, in an organization that has a ton of starting pitching depth at the major league level. You can realistically get a shot. If you are pitching well in spring training and working your way up through the minor league levels, that's exactly what John Means did. So it's really fun to see a guy that we haven't talked about that much pitch this well in spring training, and hopefully he gets a shot at the major league level. I just want to correct myself. I said it was Jeff Passan of ESPN. It was John Heyman Heyman. of MLB Network who confirmed that Michael Franco is an Oriole. So my fault there. Uh, credit incorrectly given. Um, at some point, I assume pass and we'll tweet it, but for right Probably. now, <laughs> for right yes. now, John Heyman has the news. Um, yeah, so I think I would like to see, personally like to see Rio Ruiz stick with the organization. I think he's a good guy from our dealings with him at least um, and has had some fun moments as an Oriole. Of course, his best moment as an Oriole has to be his walk-off home run against his former team. Um, onto Utah Street on an August Sunday afternoon um, in which Trey Mancini's bursting out of the the dugout. And um, that was such a great moment. And uh, he obviously has brings the slightly plus defense at third. But I think that uh, his days in the organization are unfortunately numbered. It's a very similar situation. I feel like we were having the same conversation as we had with Renato Nunez. Yeah, and Hans Alberto. The fun <laughs> moments are there. The sparks are there. You want him to succeed, but he's just on the outside looking in of a bunch of players who have been more consistent and just are overall better options. Yeah, absolutely. Also, we talked about this infield being 
better, maybe slightly better, roughly the same as it was last year. The infield at the end of the year, I think realistically, you could, instead of having Yolmer Sanchez at second, Jermai Jones at second, and and instead of having Michael Franco at third, Ryland Bannon at third. Yeah, I think, and if Freddie Galvis gets still at the deadline, if he has a good first half, could see a new shortstop as well. Maybe I don't know. Taron Vavra? Maybe? Maybe. He has gotten some run in, run in Sarasota, but it feels a little Mason early. McCoy? Mason McCoy, potentially. He played a double-A the last time we saw him. A little right. bit older, not a top-30 prospect. Um, maybe. Maybe. They might call him up. Who knows? Maybe Ramon Urias is, uh, yeah. starts out the Ramon season. Ramon Urias, Pat Valeka. Yeah. But this, this infield uh, could look drastically different by yes. the end of the season. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, spring storylines you want to get to, Brendan? I, th- I think we hit the big ones. I mean, yeah. Bruce Zimmerman the, has been amazing. How concerned are you with Paul Fry? I'm not. You, we, you're in the Brandon Hyde <laughs> camp of not I, being concerned I about Brandon, Paul the, Fry? You know what, Paul? I'll tell you exactly what my spring training philosophy is. If what there is, is a player that we were not expecting to perform well that lights the world on fire, I am going to wildly overreact and say that he should make the team and say that he is going to be great in 2021. If there is a player that we were expecting to be good who is having a horrible spring training, I will underreact. I will shove it under the rug. I will not look at it. It doesn't count. Uh, it has been very bad. It has been a very bad. You I know think what? He's given up more earned runs I don't than care. innings. I'm not, I'm not too concerned <laughs> about him either. He's a veteran guy. I think he'll be fine. Coming off a great season, I'm not too concerned about Paul Fry. Yes. Um, if it is good, I overreact. If it is bad, I look the other way. That's fair enough. How about yeah. Jemai Jones' homer? Yesterday against the Pirates. Paul, you know I love Jemai Jones. So you're going to overreact? I'm going to way overreact <laughs> J- Jemai Jones. Yeah. I'm going to sit here and say that he should be the second baseman of the future. Um, that That's just what I'm thinking, and yeah. you can't convince me otherwise. And uh, his home run in spring training tells me everything that I need to know. All right. You want to get to the old mascot draft? Oh, let's do it. All right. The rules, once again, it is a five-round draft, 10 mascots total being selected. Yes. I won the coin toss yesterday. It was not televised. We apologize. Uh, but I did win the coin toss yesterday. You did. And confirm. Thank you, Brendan. And no matter how many people tell us to stop doing these stupid drafts, we We're gonna keep will doing not. Them. We're we gonna, will keep doing them. Uh, I, won, I won the coin toss, so I selected the first overall pick. Snake draft. So I have the first pick. You have two, three. Yes. And so on and so forth. Shall I start? I think you shall. All right. I think uh, this pick I put no thought into whatsoever because I don't think I needed to. No. When you talk about the all-time Mount Rushmore pantheon of mascots, not just in baseball, but in all of sports, the Philly fanatic has to be up on that list. Yeah. He is iconic. He is green. He is furry. He is from the Galapagos Islands. Yes, he went underwent... <laughs> a reconstruction surgery last year because there was a pending lawsuit about the (laughs) designers of the Philly Fanatic wanting the proper credit. The Phillies said, we don't want to pay you. We're going to redesign the mascot slightly, just enough to avoid a lawsuit. Uh, They did. So that took some points off. However, he is still adorable. He has the antics. He has the hot dog gun. He has the The hot dog gun. The hot dog gun. He does have a lawsuit. We're, there's so many mascot lawsuits that we're going to talk about. Too many. He, he, a woman, I think, tried to sue him because he we used the hot dog gun and hit her too hard with a hot dog. And uh, That'll she happen. suffered an injury. Uh, I think I remember that. Yeah, yeah. that was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, Gritty has joined the, the city of Philadelphia mascots and kind of stolen the spotlight. However, Philly Fanatic is still the best mascot in baseball. He's my number one overall pick. I think that had to be the pick, and I honestly would have been pretty disappointed in you yeah. if it wasn't the pick. I have a feeling that you know way more about these mascots than I do, and way I'm more. a little concerned going into the draft I'm a that big I am mascot. just really underwhelming. I don't know if I... I, I want to see the final numbers here on how many of these mascots have pants are wearing anything. It's a good question. Yeah. Below the it waist. It deserves to be asked. So far, we're 0 for 1 in terms of pants. Yes. Philly Fanatic, not wearing pants. That we are. Uh, I have the number two and number three overall selections. Yeah. Uh, the number two, I also think, is kind of, maybe not as obvious, but I think it's another one of the most fun mascots in baseball. And that's going to be Orbit. Ooh. A if, little higher than I expected. Look, the thing with Orbit is... We don't know what he knew. Yeah, look at that smile. 
He, I mean, he might have known. That look, there is no humanity behind that smile. Not that we would expect it because he's an alien. However, he is, that is a smirk if I've ever seen one. Look, it, it comes off as cute, but then, you know, you look at it long enough and you think, there's something going on there. There is a chance that he was the mastermind behind the scandal. We don't know for sure. All I know for sure is that he's a bundle of fun. I love the antics. I am all about them. My, Orbit is my number two selection. Another mascot, green furry without pants. However, he does sometimes run out onto the field wearing just underwear. That which he does. Which means he takes off his jersey and puts underwear on. Which, Paul, I would argue is objectively hilarious. It's pretty, it's pretty funny. Yeah. I, love watching, I love watching on Facebook our viewers just crater after this. <laughs> There's just our viewer count is just yeah. diving down. Yeah. We're powering through, Brendan. That we are. Um. You have the number three pick? That I do, and I have tossed this one around a lot. Yep. There are a lot of options, and I thought to myself, should I just be a homer? And I went, yeah. Yeah. I should. The number three overall pick is going to be the Oriole Bird. Good pick. I, you know what? The more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what? I can't be here with the number two and number three overall selections and have Paul get both the Philly Fanatic and the Oriole Bird? Yeah, I think I'd clean up. I just couldn't do it. I mean, look at this guy. He's yeah. the best. He, he is a classic. He will get on top of the dugout and sing, thank God I'm a country boy. He will in do an interview with Paul Mancano. The Oriole Bird that's, does it all. That's the highlight of my massing career. The yeah. Opening day interview I would agree. with the Oriole Bird. Yes. All right. Fourth overall pick. I have four and five, Brendan. Yeah. I might lose some fans here, but I'm going to go with Wally. That's green a Green monster yep. with Boston. Strangely enough about Wally, he is both the green monster and he lives in the green monster. That would be like, I'm Paul and I live in Nepal. That wouldn't make any sense. So it, you know. You could live in like Nepal, like a country. That's, that's clever. Uh -huh. uh, that was almost my selection with the number three overall pick. And I don't think you, I could have lived with myself no, if I picked you, the Red Sox mascot. Over the Oriole Over bird. the yeah. Oriole bird. That's tough. However, another furry green monster. I believe Wally does wear pants. I th maybe. Yeah. A the Oriole bird king. does not wear anything but a hat. So, no. you know, that's kind of tough. But he does have a ridiculous tail. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I'll go with Wally. And then fifth pick, uh, I'm going to go with Dinger. With the Colorado Rockies. Ooh. And this is because of his story. Do you know why they picked a, a dinosaur mascot? Paul, how about you tell me why? First off, he's an adorable tricer triceratops. That he is. Second off, it was partly because of the discovery of a seven-foot-long triceratops skull that they dug up while going through the construction of Coors Field. Huh. Now that is a fun fact you can bring to dinner with the in-laws. I might just do that. Yeah. That, that is a fun fact, and I am really glad that you have brought that up. Our people are uh, mad that I have not taken Mr. Met. However, I'm sticking by my pick. I think Mr. Met's kind of creepy. <laughs> Mr. Met has uh, had some, Mr. you know, Met knows given some, some stuff. rough hand gestures at, at, at fans in the past that have yeah. gone viral. So uh, I'm going with another furry green monster. Okay. Uh, and, my and next pick, uh, I'm cutting you off. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my next pick is going to be Maybe a little controversial, but I just think he is hilarious. And that is the swinging friar. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, I just pick. think he is so funny. I mean, look at that guy. That's a mascot. Why? Yeah. He is a mystery man of God. <laughs> he doesn't, he wears sandals. I'm all in on this guy. Swinging friar. Um, he's a little, he, Crosses over into the creepy category for me. I don't, I'm not a big fan of human mascots that are dressed like, but I mean, it, look at him. He's ridiculous and I love it. Yeah. He's, he's, he's kind of funny. I don't know. It, it just, he, he would rubs me the wrong way. I'll say that about swinging fryer. I, I opt for the, the cute over the creepy when it comes to this draft. That's fair. But I think you are missing just how hilarious the swinging fryer is. Okay. And I think that's why uh, you missed on him on your pick. Who's next? Uh, the next one, I was holding off on this pick for a while, but I think he's too iconic not to go with at this spot, and that's going to be Mr. Met. I think when you are looking at mascots in Major League Baseball, I don't know if there is a mascot that is as synonymous with their team as Mr. Met is. Yeah. Of course, outside of the Philly Fanatic. My, my issue with that is you're synonymous with your team. That's great, 
but your team is the Mets. So this you're is true. synonymous with, you know. With the Mets. Yeah. You raise a good point there, but I think just for the history and for how well known he is, Mr. Met, I think is a, is a steal here at number seven. Yeah, that's a good pick. Uh, I'm going to go back into the cute pile here. Have to. I'm going to go with Stomper. Ooh. The Oakland A's mascot. Stomper I know you the pro- elephant. I know you probably didn't have him on your big board. Oh, yes, I did. Oh, you had him on your I'm big board. I'm a big board. stomper guy. Right. I think he is adorable. He I think is. he is up there with the cutest mascots. He's been around there a long time, and I feel good about that pick. And then immediately after, hmm. All right, is this my last pick, or do I have? This uh, is, my this last is pick? your last pick. Then Paul. I'm going to change course here. I'm going to go with Mr. Redlegs. Ooh. I'm going to go off board because I have taken all cute mascots up until this point. I would need to take somebody who's slightly creepy, and that is Mr. Redlegs. <laughs> Mr. Redlegs is slightly creepy. He is That's like correct. A, he is like a knockoff Mr. Met. Um, he has the magnificent mustache, and maybe one of the better— He does. This is Sports Center commercials. Yes. Is one where he's you know trimming his mustache, and he's going to win the mustache competition that year. He has joined by several other Reds mascots, so that kind of takes the shine off him. However— I feel good about my team now of five mascots, which includes the Philly Fanatic, Wally, Dinger, um, Stomper, and now Mr. Redlegs. That's a good pick there, Paul. And it leaves me in a very interesting situation here. I think there are a few mascots that I could go with. I think Slugger is a very good possibility. Yeah, just missed my big board. Uh, because he has a crown for a head, and that is super cool. Kansas City Royals. I think Bernie Brewer is a possibility. Ooh. That mustache, iconic. Yeah. You want to talk about the Mr. Redlegs mustache? Bernie Brewer has himself a mustache. Better than John Means' spring training mustache. There's the Pirate's Parrot, which has not been picked yet, which is also a very good mascot. But there's one mascot, Paul, that I'm just a sucker for. Yeah, and I think I know who this is. And that is Lucille. The mascot from the San Francisco Giants. It's Lucille. Maybe the best name of any mascot. I believe the full name is Lu- Luigi Francisco Seal. <laughs> and that that gets my pick. <laughs> That's awesome. If your name is Luigi Francisco Seal, that isn't incredible. Yeah. The look isn't as cute as it maybe should be or could be. I think there's a little bit of missed potential there with Lucille. But still. It's pretty cute. Luigi Francisco. I think you needed an infusion of cute on your team because you have Orbit, who's cute. Yep. Oreo Bird, not exactly cute. Iconic. Iconic. Yep. Swinging Friar, creepy. Mr. Met, creepy. You needed a little <laughs> bit more of a cuteness. So your team is Orbit, you are Oreo missing, Bird, Swinging Friar, Mr. You Met, are Lucio. just way off the mark I on am, how hilarious the Swinging Friar is. I think I knocked this out of the park. I have I have antics in the Philly Fanatic and Wally. Uh, I have the, uh, the cuteness in... You know, uh, Dinger and Stomper and Mr. Red, or not Mr. Redlegs. And uh, you have the, the crazy mustache two. and the great yeah. ESPN commercial with Mr. Redlegs. I, I think, think you won pretty much automatically with the Philly Fanatic. Yeah, I think that is, that puts me, puts me over the top. So for the record, I think this means that I have won the real drafts and you have won the, the mascot draft. This is the real draft. Uh, Natalie yeah. in our comments saying I won the draft. Yep, thank you. Uh, just because Brendan picked the Friar. Oh, come on, the Friar. Hate to see it. Uh, what should we draft next? Let us know. Let us know in the comments. We've done pasta. We've done mascots. We've yeah. done, believe it or not, things that actually pertain to baseball. And get this. Michael Franco is an Oreo going all the way back to the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> that is, <laughs> in case you missed the actual case, important yeah. part of our podcast, which was the mascot draft. Yeah. Uh, Michael Franco, now an Oreo. Absolutely. Uh, exciting stuff. Let us know what you think of the addition to the Orioles team. Let us know what you think of, of Rio Ruiz and his future with the Orioles organization. Of course, at Paul Mancano is my Twitter handle. Brendan is at Brendan Morty. That I am. And of course, follow MassInSports.com to keep you updated on everything Orioles. We're doing some spring training recaps. Hope to have one out for you tomorrow after tomorrow's game um, to kind of keep you guys informed and, and updated to see some highlights from Sarasota, Florida. So we appreciate you following along there as well. We will be back in a week. Yes, we will. I'm Paul. He's Brendan. We'll see you later.